So, Thank you very much for having me. Really oh, pleased sorry, to be one here. Fight. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Not a comment. I was going to say, uh, if you could turn off your cameras, uh, as this uh, co-host is going to do now, just it cuts down on the bandwidth, makes it smoother for everyone. Okay. Good to go. All right. Um, welcome, everyone, to this session on chaos engineering for SQL Server. Just a little bit about myself first. My name is Andrew Prosky. I'm a SQL Server DBA, Microsoft Data Platform MVP, certified Kubernetes administrator, and I'm out and about in the community. Um, I help run Data Relay in the UK. Um, I'm also uh, helping run a online event called 8KB, and we've got some other events coming up called Mixed Extents, so please keep an eye out for them. And also I help run an event in Ireland called Data Cayley, which will be well scheduled for its inaugural event this year, but unfortunately got cancelled, so we've moved everything to 2021. So I know you're all in the UK, so short hop over when this all clears. Data Cayley, come on over, it's going to be great. My Twitter handle at DBA from the cold and my email address DBA from the cold at gmail.com on the slides there. So if you have any questions after today, or, or if you just want to talk about this stuff, please reach out. I'm always willing to talk about this stuff. My blog's there, dbafromthecold.com. Post an article about Chaos Engineering SQL Server, which I'm hoping to add to this summer, so you can check that out. And then finally, there's my GitHub account at the bottom there, where the slides and all the code for the demos that I'll be running are available. So if you want to grab those, you are more than welcome. Okay, on to the session. The aim of this session is to talk about how SQL Server fails. How does it fail? What do we do to prevent that failure? And how do we test the systems that we put in place that prevent those failures? Or how do we basically, how do we prevent downtime for SQL Server? This is the whole premise of chaos engineering. Chaos engineering is really is a little bit of a buzzword for resiliency testing. Resilience testing, my bad. So, what we're going to talk about today is how we can apply chaos engineering principles and methods to SQL Server. So we're going to talk a little bit about the history of chaos engineering. Then we're going to talk about what chaos engineering is, how we can identify failures or perceived weaknesses in systems running SQL Server, how we can run a chaos engineering experiment. I'm going to do that in a demo up in Azure. And then finally, to round the session off, we'll have a little bit of fun and we'll have a look at SQL Server running on Kubernetes, one of my favorite subjects at the moment, because Kubernetes is a brand new platform that we can run SQL Server on. And guess what? There are weaknesses in it. Weaknesses that we can test with chaos engineering experiments. The first things first, what is chaos engineering? So, a little bit of history. Back in 2008, Netflix experienced a major outage which resulted in their platform being down for three days. Now, this is back when the majority of their business was sending DVDs out to customers. They weren't the, quite the behemoth they are now. Could you imagine if Netflix went down for three days now? So they went, they went out for three days and they, started to evaluate, they brought everything back up and they evaluated what had happened. And they had a single point of failure. It was actually due to um, a massive database corruption issue. So they moved out of a traditional data center and they decided to migrate to the cloud. And when they went to the cloud, they went with a distributed architecture. The idea being was to remove that single point of failure. And when they went to the cloud, they adopted the mindset of, in order to prevent failures, we will fail constantly. The reason being here is when they went to the cloud, the cloud wasn't quite as stable as it was. We're talking AWS in this case. There were certain instances where instances would just blip out of existence. So they had to write resiliency into their code to account for that. And what they ended up doing was basically enforcing people to account for that randomness of failures in the AWS platform. And out of that, Chaos Monkey was born. Chaos Monkey's sole purpose is to go through their production environment and randomly terminate instances. Turn them off, see how that platform copes. The idea being is that if their platform cannot cope with a pseudo-semi-controlled uh, pseudo outage, how will it react to a fully uncontrolled outage? What they're doing here increasing their confidence in the resilience of their platform 
by in injecting what's called turbulence into their environment. So this is how chaos engineering came to be. It all started at Netflix with Chaos Monkey and it's grown from there. So what is chaos engineering exactly? Now, the definition there is from the principles of chaos.org website, and it says that chaos engineering is a discipline of experimenting upon a system in order to build confidence in its resilience when it is exposed to turbulent conditions in production. How does a system react to failures in production? Does it react the way we expect it to, or is there something unforeseen there? So, we are basically analyzing our environment seeing any perceived weaknesses or failures and running experiments upon the systems to prove that the systems react the way we expect them to when they encounter a failure. Now, that slide there says production. I want to talk briefly about what chaos engineering is not because I feel there are some misconceptions about what it is. We are not here to break things in production. We are not here to cause outages. If I went to my manager and I said, hey, we're going to start experiencing the increased amount of outages because I am an engineer of chaos, I'd be marched out of that front door pretty darn quickly. What we are here to do is increase confidence in the resiliency of our systems. We are not here to cause outages. So I said, it says production on the other slide. Do we need to do this in production? Not really. I mean, if you have a staging environment that is similarly configured to a production environment, there is no reason you can't run your chaos engineering experiments there. In fact, when you first get into chaos engineering, I highly recommend you don't go anywhere near your production environment first. Do this all in staging. Okay, we're not gonna get the same amount of throughput or database size that we would in production, but we can at least make sure our SQL instances are configured the same way as production. So say, if you have always on availability groups in production, you should have them in your staging environment because you can test against them. And then when you run your tests in staging, if it's configured the same way as production, you can be reasonably sure that your production environment will behave the same way. Now, not 100%, but it's better than nothing, and it's better than just throwing stuff into production and seeing how it goes and causing outages. So, it's a little bit of history about chaos engineering. That's what it is, that's what it isn't. Let's go ahead and let's get started with how we can apply chaos engineering to our environment. Now, the first thing we need to do is define our systems. So, we need to know what's going on in our environment so we can start looking at things to see where we can apply our chaos engineering experiments. So we start from the ground up with our infrastructure. What do we have running? Where is it running? Are we on premises? Are we up in the cloud? Do we have a private data center? And what's running in those environments? Do we have physical machines? Do we have virtual machines? Do we have some sort of serverless architecture? Do we have a Kubernetes cluster sitting in the corner scaring everyone? What is running there? And once we know what's running in our environment, this sounds obvious, but who here has ever been pinged or done some patching on a system where someone's pinged them and said, hey, this application's thrown a bunch of errors. And you've sort of gone, I had no idea that application hit my SQL boxes. That type of stuff. Or even so, I had it last week, someone pinged me about a server that was built back in 2016 and said, hey, do you still need this box? And I was looking at it going, I have never seen that box in my entire life. We need to know exactly what is running in our data centers so that we can start working with chaos engineering. So once we have that, we can then have a look at the applications running, not just SQL Server, but everything that's hitting it. What is hitting our SQL instances? We have applications hitting our SQL instances. How do the applications react to that SQL instance going down? Do they just start throwing errors? Do they have some sort of retry logic in there? If SQL goes down and comes back up, how do they react? Will they just start working again? Or do we have to have some sort of manual intervention to get them up and running? So we need to know not only our SQL instances, uh, instances, but also the applications that are hitting them. 
Now moving slightly back, what monitoring do we have in our environment? How do we know if there's going to be an issue? If there is an issue, when do we get alerted? Do we get alerted right away? Is there a delay? Is the monitoring system highly available? If the monitoring goes down and there's an issue, do we get notified? Another thing is, when we run our chaos engineering experiments, we can eyeball them and have a look at the results, and we will do that in the demo later. But we want to get as much data as we possibly can when we run our experiments. If the SQL instance goes down, how long is it down for? If it comes up, are those databases in recovery? How long are they in recovery for? Is the app throwing errors immediately as soon as, immediately as, soon as the SQL instance goes down? When the databases come back up, does it automatically connect? Does it continue throwing errors? The retry logic, again, is that, is that there? What's happening? We want to get as much data as we possibly can from running these experiments. So we want some nice monitoring systems pointed at our SQL instances. And it's not like we don't have enough to choose from. There's a whole bunch of paid solutions that we can buy out there. We can even build our own things like Nagia, Zabbix, Grafana, whole load of stuff. There's no excuse for not having some detailed monitoring at your SQL instances. And then social. Guess what? You and your team are a potential source of weakness. Who here has ever worked on a team where there is one person who looks after one entire system? They've installed it, they administer it, they deal with any issues, they handle any upgrades. They are the font of all knowledge for that system. I know I have. Take that person out of the room. Simulate that system going down. How does the rest of the team react to that system going down? Can, do they have the skills to bring that system back up? If they don't have the knowledge to bring that system back up, do they have access to get the knowledge to bring that system back up? So we're talking things like an in-house wiki uh, with all the details there, or just a bunch of uh, a GitHub repository with a bunch of scripts for troubleshooting. Or we can even use things like Azure Data Studio notebooks, just basically run books that take us through step by step how to troubleshoot a system. So those are the type of things we need to look at when we're defining our system to see what we want to test with a chaos engineering experiment. Where do we want to focus? Or the, what are the types of things we can focus on? So when we've got that, we can then start looking for specific failures or weaknesses that we want to test. The best way to do that is what's called a past instant analysis. Now the reason we're doing this is because we want to get some actionable results from the chaos engineering experiments that we run. We don't want to run a test saying, hey, SQL reacted exactly as we expected it to when it encountered this. And someone go, well, that's never really going to happen. You've kind of wasted all our time. here." We want to look at what's previously happened in the environment to get a sort of idea of where we want to go with our tests. So how has the system failed previously? Say we had a standalone SQL instance. That instance went down, it was brought back up, issue resolved, but then some sort of high availability solution was brought in to prevent that issue from happening again. Whatever that might be, it might be database mirroring, it might be log shipping, it might be failover clusters, always on availability groups, replication if you're nuts but something brought in to prevent that issue from happening again so maybe we want to test that high availability solution because what we're doing here is building up confidence in the solutions that we put in place so that we will know they will react the way we expect them to when they encounter a failure so past instant analysis, however you record them, me and my team, we use Jira, we log instance there, and we have a weekly instant meeting where we talk about all this stuff. It's all nicely logged, we can search through. Best place to start when you're looking for an individual failure to test with your first chaos engineering experiment. Other thing you can do is a likelihood impact map or analysis. Now, this is where you sit down with your team and talk about how you think SQL Server can fail or any perceived weaknesses in your systems. So I know if you do this, sit down with your team, this is great fun. You're basically talking about how things can go horribly wrong. And DBIs on it, they all love talking about how SQL Server can fail. So you think about how it's going to fail, and then you rank them on this map here and how likely they are and what is the impact of that failure happening. 
So hopefully you will end up with a whole bunch of failures spread across this graph and you'll have some up in the red there. And those are your candidates for your first tests. Now, some people, myself included, tend to be a little bit overly optimistic or overly pessimistic when it comes to talking about SQL Server failures. And I'll let you guess which way I sort of lean with that. But if that does happen, you might end up with them all clumped in one little group at the top or at the bottom. Zoom in on the graph, do the analysis again to get that spread across. And the ones at the top, hopefully you'll have two or three, are your candidates for your tests. So let's talk about potential scenarios that we can test. So I've already mentioned one, high availability. In the past instance analysis, we found that we had a single standalone SQL instance. That instance went down, was brought back up, issue resolved, but we decided to build, say, an always on availability group, a simple one, two node cluster, automatic failover with, say, file share widgets. Let's test that failover. Is it going to work exactly as we expect it to? When people build, always on availability groups. What's the first thing they do? They build it, they get, the, they get it all sorted, they fail it over. They say, alter availability group, fail over. Fail it over to the secondary, confirm everything's okay, then fail it back to the primary. But is that how that availability group is going to fail in production? How is that primary node gonna fail? Is it gonna have a very clinical, someone running a T-SQL script to gently fail it over? Or is that primary node just gonna go, and keel over. So how about just switching off that primary node? Was that a more realistic test of how that availability group will fail over? So maybe we, we could do something like that. Okay, thinking of something else, let's go with backups. Probably one of the key jobs of a DBA is we back up our databases. Why do we back up our databases? Because things can go wrong. Do we just back our databases up? No, a backup is no good unless it's been tested as a restore. Paul Randall tells a great story about a client he was working with that had a database corruption issue and they had to restore their database. But they were only backing up full backup once a month and then just running transaction log backups. So even though they had the backups, the restore was just basically impossible to get within their company's RTO, recovery time objective. How quickly can you restore your backups? Because they were restoring these thousands upon thousands upon thousands of log backups. So when we're thinking about our backups, we need to be testing our restores. So we back up our databases, and then we have maybe a chaos engineering experiment. It's running constantly. We can run on a server where we're testing our restores. We can grab a database from our environment, use something to generate those scripts, whether it be in-house or maybe use DBA tools. It's a great PowerShell module for all database professionals that we can just use to generate our scripts, restore our databases, right, check DBA against you, boom, we know that database will, we can restore it when we really need to. Because it does happen. Um, let me tell you a story. A few jobs ago now, I was working in Bristol and I was using a third party tool to back up all my databases. Not proud of it. The reason I was doing it was because I was working with SQL Server 2005. This is how long ago it was. And I wanted to compress my backups. SQL Server 2005 doesn't have native compression. So third party tool provided that, was using it, absolutely wonderful. Had it deployed throughout my environment and it was sitting there, it was backing up everything. And I was happy as Larry sitting there typing away until. One day, one of the developers came to me and said, we got an issue with one of our databases. We need to, a lot of data has been deleted. We need to do a, a restore to about a few hours ago, make sure all the data is there, and we just leave it that way. We can pump some more data in, get it back to the point. Can you do a point in time restore for us? I was sitting there going, of course I can. Got the backups, got the log backups, got my wicked little third party tool with its GUI interface. I went to restore this database. Now this database was about three terabytes. So not insignificant, but not massive. So got the full backup and went to restore it. And this third party tool had a little feature just in the side that was an 
instant restore feature. So I check that because who wouldn't want to instantly restore a three terabyte database? So check that, hit execute. The restore went up to about 99%. And there it stayed for five hours before promptly failing. I hadn't been testing restoring my databases with that feature. So when I really needed it, it didn't work the way I wanted it. I expected it to. I ended up having to do, blowing that away, I had to do a normal restore, which took three terabyte database from last thing. It took uh, uh, overnight, basically. But we got it back up and it worked. But I should have been regularly testing my restores using that feature so that when I counted on it, it would work. Okay. Let's go for another one. Let's think monitoring. Yeah, I mentioned monitoring earlier. Monitoring can be a source of failure. If your monitoring is not highly available, will you get notified? We use Nagios that hooks into something called PagerDuty. Nagios fires an alert, hits into PagerDuty. I get a page on my phone. Nagios goes down. I'm not going to get any pages. But how do we test this type of thing? A good thing is, when do we get alerted? So let's think. Let's have a runaway query on a database. Not uncommon. This query is just churning through data, just on the log, it's getting fuller and fuller, and the file's getting bigger and bigger, and it's starting to get ever so closer to the size of the disk. When do we get alerted that that's happening? Do we just get paged at the end saying, disk is full, log is full, bump, sort it out? Or do we get paged whilst that log growth is happening? I'd rather be notified that an issue is about to occur, and I can do something about it, than before the issue has, and then after the issue has actually occurred, and I have to go in and fix something. So that's a nice little test that we can do. We can point our monitoring and a staging box, create a database, create some really terrible queries, and just churn through that log and see what happens. Because again, we rely on our monitoring. So we need it to work as we expect it to, when we really need it. Okay, let's do another one. Let's do, I know, probably the most obvious one, most common one, user error. Who here has ever run an update statement against a production database table without a where clause? Be honest, that most people have. So tell you another story. A couple of jobs ago, I was working with a very good DBA but he ended up running a update statement against a production database without a where clause, the result of which for a 20 minute period, whilst we got it all sorted out, did a side by side point time restore and copy data over to set it back. That every transaction that that company did for 20 minutes had a 15% discount applied to it. Real cracker. So how do we prevent this? How can we test for this? Well, this is probably more of a social thing. This is why was he running an ad hoc update state against the production table? Shouldn't there have been some sort of deployment pipeline it was going through? If we do have a deployment pipeline, will it pick up on stuff like that? If you shove an update without a where clause through your deployment pipeline, is it going to highlight the fact that an update statement has no where clause? Is it going to do anything or is it just going to run it and throw it out there and just you'll have to deal with the outcome? I mean, Lots of things you can test. I mean, what we ended up doing was we ended up installing something called SSMS Boost, which is a product you can hook into SMS that will actually analyze the queries that you're running and say, hey, this doesn't have an update statement. Uh, this update statement doesn't have a where clause. Are you sure you want to run this? And yeah, I mean, it's not foolproof because you do kind of get a little bit used to just pressing OK every single time it pops up. But it's an extra step to prevent it. Another thing we did was remove our sysadmin rights to our Windows accounts so that we can't just double click on a server, go in and do whatever we want. We have, um, we had SQL authenticated accounts that we weren't allowed to save. So if we wanted to do any admin work, we had to log in using that, type in our password and go in and then we knew we had admin. I mean, again, not foolproof because you know, you can leave connections open and stuff like that. Just, just another way of stopping us from doing things like that. Okay, let's do one more and that's going to be Let's go nuclear, disaster recovery. Do we have a disaster recovery plan? 
to, if you don't, you really need one. Now, managers and sea uh, level people hate disaster recovery because it's expensive and hopefully you'll never have to use it. But when you come to use it or when you come to need it, oh, are you thankful it's there? So again, another story, friend of mine, uh, the end of last year, company running all their production systems in a private data center here in Dublin, private data, uh, private data centers never have any problems, right? This one decided to have a four hour power cut just at the end of last year, which resulted in this company's systems being down for four hours. No production, no uh, disaster recovery solution. It was deemed unnecessary because hey, private data centers never have any issues. So could your company survive a four hour outage? I mean, it was, I mean, it was longer than a four hours. It was a four hours, everything was down. When things came back up, they had to deal with all these different sort of firewall issues that came up because configurations got messed up and things like that. But the entire thing down for four hours. So you need a disaster recovery plan and you also need to be testing it on a regular basis. You do not want to be enacting your disaster recovery plan for the first time when you really need it. And because things like this don't happen at two o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon. They happen at two o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. And you don't want to be sitting there going, oh God, I hope I set this up right. You want to know, hey, I can run this script and boom, we are back up. So those are a whole bunch of potential scenarios that we could possibly test with our chaos engineering experiments. Because what we're looking for is which failure has the highest likelihood, which failure has the highest impact, and what will we gain from testing that failure? So we can run all our tests and say, hey, if they pass, awesome. We've proved that the systems we've built react to failure the way we expect them to. If they don't react the way we expect them to, them to then we can go off, we can analyze it, probably come up with some sort of release to say, hey, we need to make some configuration changes here, here, and here, deploy that, and then we can run our experiments again to confirm that it now reacts the way we want it to. Now, the final point there is, is there anything else that can be tested? And what this means is, is there anything that you haven't thought of? Which is kind of unfair, really, because it's, hey, Andrew, is there anything you haven't thought of? I don't know, I haven't thought of it. What I'm saying here is go and talk to people outside your teams because we've done a past incident analysis with our team. We've talked about potential failures of SQL Server with our team, but go and talk to everyone else in the room. Go and talk to your sysadmins. Go and talk to your network admins. Go and talk to your developers. Go and talk to your end users because I guarantee they will have seen or will potentially see failures in the systems that you won't have thought of. In fact, the end users are probably the best people to go and talk to because it's all about the end users, right? So go and talk to people outside of your team and see what they come up with for the potential things that you can test with your chaos engineering experiments. Okay, so let's go ahead. There's enough of me talking. Let's go ahead and let's get into actually running an experiment. So what failure are we going to test? Now, I've already mentioned it. Let's talk about what happens if the primary node in an availability group cluster fails. Now, we've got a very simple setup here. It's very common, I'd imagine, a primary and a secondary. What happens to our databases when that primary node goes down? Does everything go down? Or does it fail over as expected and our databases stay online? So let's talk about actually running the experiment. So we define our experiment method. Oh, sorry, skipping ahead, hypothesis. So what do we think is going to happen? The listener of the availability group should remain online. So the endpoint for our availability group, the thing that all the applications use to connect to our databases. This should stay online when the primary node fails. So what this means is the availability group has failed over to the secondary node and our endpoint, the listener is online, we can connect to it. All of our databases are still online. Method, how are we gonna test this? Now I can run the T-SQL and say, ultra availability group failover. It's a very sanitized way of testing a failover for an availability group. So how about I stop the database engine service on the primary node? So use a bit of PowerShell, stop it. What I'm doing here is simulating 
that primary node going down. So was that a more of a realistic test of how an availability group is going to fail out in the wild? Probably, because there's not going to be so someone running a T-SQL script the moment a server starts having issues. So let's stop that and see what happens. And then roll back. Now, when you run your chaos engineering experiments, and I'm being a bit hypocritical here because I don't have them because this is a lab, but whenever you run a chaos engineering experiment, you need to have scripts or something available to instantly restore to a point in time your databases just in case the worst happens. Plan for the worst, hope for the best. You don't want to be scrabbling around trying to get scripts together to restore your databases if something has horribly gone wrong. But because this is a lab, all I'm going to do to roll back is restart the database engine service on my primary node. OK, so let's go ahead and let's have a look at my lab. I need to find my mouse. OK, so up here, I have in my lab in Azure, I have an availability group with two servers, AP SQL AG01, which is the primary, and AP SQL AG02, which is the secondary. So nice and simple, and I'm on the, I'm not on the primary here, I'm on, so what I can do is let's do a test, let's see if my AG will fail over. So very simple, ultra availability group AG1 failover, so I'm telling SQL, right, move this availability group from a one to a two, so we do a refresh, and a refresh. Oh, one is now my secondary, and O2 is now my primary. And sorry, I should have showed you. I've only got a bunch of test databases in here. So you've got 10 test databases. They're all synced up. There's actually nothing in them whatsoever. So, but it doesn't matter. We're just testing the ability of that availability group to fail over. OK. So I failed over from 01 to 02. Let's switch it back and fail back from 02 to 01. So same again. Auto availability group failover. Tell it SQL, hey, move this availability group now from 02 back to the original primary 01. Do a refresh and a refresh. Oh, nope. Databases look good, but there's the primary. There's the secondary. OK. So I know that my availability group can fail from 01 to 02 and can fail back from 02 to 01. But remember, that's not how it's going to fail out in the wild. So let's jump into Visual Studio Code. Am I in the right place? Yes. OK, what I have here is just a script. Uh, what it's going to do, it takes a couple of parameters, a server name and an availability group name. It grabs the listener for that availability group. And I've got a whole bunch of stuff here to make it look pretty. And then it does a test net connection against that listener. It's basically testing to see if the listener is online and available. Then I pass that into a pester test. This is mainly for making it look pretty. And then we come down here and we force stop the SQL server service on the primary node. So we're simulating that node going down. And then we run our test again and pass it into the pester test. So if everything's going well, the availability group should fail from 01 to 02. And then I can run this test net connection against the listener, and the listener will have failed over to O2, will be online, and I will be able to connect to all my databases. Basically, the AG has responded exactly the way I expect it to when it has encountered a failure. And then I have a rollback here of restarting just in case everything goes horribly wrong. So let's bring this up a little bit. And come, oh, so let's bring it up a little bit, and let's run our chaos engineering experiment. So first thing that should happen is testing that the availability group listeners online. Now we're testing that it's online on the primary to make sure everything is expected whilst we kick this off. Listeners online, OK. So let's go ahead and let's stop the service on the primary node. So I'm running that stop service force. We see SQL servers waiting to go down. That's because the listeners are there. And now we're running that test again. Excellent. OK. Things look like they've all passed. I'm just going to reset that. And what that means is, if we do a refresh, 
and a refresh. O1 is now the secondary, and O2 is now the primary. So it's responded exactly the same way as the T-SQL script has. We've killed that primary node. The AG has realized, oh, the primary node is dead and has failed over to the secondary, exactly as I expected it to. So let's run that test again. Let's clear that out. And let's run that experiment one more time. So this time we're hitting O2, which is now the primary, testing the listeners online, which it is, and now we're gonna stop the service on that primary node. Waiting for SQL to go down. And then we can run test against our listener. So what should have happened here is the AG has passed from O2 to O1, exactly as we did the T-SQL scripts, and has come online. And I can already tell you that something has gone wrong here. It should not be taking that long for the listener to come up. So we, our listener doesn't seem to be online. We've killed the primary node of the AG, but the availability group has not failed over to back to 01. So we were on 02, killed 02. It should have failed over back to 01, but it hasn't. So let's have a look. So this was the secondary. And it still is. And this is the primary. So we were trying to fail back from 02 to 01, but it's failed. The AG is still on 02 as the primary. So something has gone wrong here. This hasn't reacted the way we expected it to when it encountered a failure. Now, I'm not going to bore you with trying to guess why this has happened. I can tell you immediately. The role here, this clustered role, is AG1, which is our availability group. If you come into properties here, go to failover, there are these settings here. Specify the number of times the cluster service will attempt to restart or fail over the clustered role in the specified period. Maximum failures in the specified period of one in six hours. So this AG can only fail once in six hours, every six hours, Otherwise, if it fails again, it will be left in a failed state. And that is why it did not fail over when we killed O2 when it was the primary node. Okay, a little bit of a setup here, but guess what the default values are when you set up a clustered service in Windows? They are those values. So we could use T-SQL to fail over our AG as much as we want. And it will always work. But if we just yank the service out from underneath SQL, because of these settings in, a cluster, in the cluster role here, if we have more than one failure in six hours, our AG will not fail over. It will remain in a failed state, and we'll have to come in and do something manually to get it to work. So let's do something manually. Let's, I'm not recommending these settings. I'm just going to drop a 10 in there. Hit OK. And let's come back into our test, and let's retry our experiment. So same again, testing the listeners online on O2, and now we're going to stop that SQL service. Waiting for it to go down. And now we're going to test to see if that listener's online. Come on. Boom. Listener is online. I'm just going to run that script there, make sure everything's okay. Good. Let's do a refresh and a refresh. And now our AG is back on 01 as the primary and 02 as the secondary. So we've run a chaos engineering experiment against our availability group. We've realized that there might be a possible configuration issue. We've gone in, made a change rerun our chaos engineering experiment and now our AG reacts the way we expect it to when it encounters a failure. Now I'm doing this in the lab. I have to admit when I was first setting this demo up I was running through it going okay yeah, that's working as I expected to. Great, great demo. Really like that one. And then I thought I can't remember the last time I checked those settings 
on my clusters in my production environment. So I went and I checked my clusters the next day, and guess what? There were a couple of them in my production environment that had those default settings. So even by running a chaos engineering experiment in a lab that I've built in Azure, I've got some actionable results that I can take and apply to my production SQL instances. So that is running chaos, a chaos engineering experiment against a uh, lab in Azure. Just to get some actionable results, we can do it. And the best thing about this stuff is you can run chaos engineering experiments with any tools you want. We could have done this manually. We could have gone in and stopped the service via SQL Config Manager and seen how it reacted. I can write a little bit of PowerShell, so I'm comfortable with that. Whatever you're comfortable with, you can use to run your experiments. There's actually a tool out there called the Chaos, uh, chaos Toolkit. It's all written in Python. Uh, if you're really good with Python, go ahead, check it out. It's open source, it's on GitHub. I'll have a link to it at the end. Um, what I really like about it is you can actually plug scripts into it. So the way I've used it in the past is just to plug my PowerShell scripts into it and run my Chaos Toolkit experiments that way. And the reason I do that is because it gives me quite a lot of cool things, like it gives me some verbose logging and some better output and things like a nice rollback instead of maybe my cobbled together PowerShell scripts. So whichever way you want to run your experiments, you can which is why I really like chaos engineering. It's just the, it's the end goal, not the method that we're looking at here. Okay, so that's pretty much everything I want to talk about with chaos engineering. I want to run another experiment now yep. with one of my favorite um, technologies at the moment, which is Kubernetes. I've been all over this stuff for a while now, and I really, really like it because it's basically another platform that we can run SQL Server on. Variety is the spice of life. Before, we only used to have SQL Server running on Windows. Now we've got SQL Server on Linux, SQL Server up in the cloud as a managed instance even, or Amazon's RDS, loads of stuff. And now we have SQL Server running on Kubernetes. Now, the definition on my web, on the on the page there is from the kubernetes.io website and it says that kubernetes is an open source platform for deploying and managing containerized applications great what exactly does that mean what about docker isn't docker a platform for deploying and managing containerized applications what's the difference high availability is one of the key differences and there's one i want to focus on here with Docker, you install it on a host, you run your containers there. What happens if that host goes down? With Kubernetes, we can have a fleet of hosts where we run our containers. So if one host goes down, it doesn't matter. We have that built-in high availability. There's also another layer of high availability with Kubernetes in the concept of a desired state versus running state. We define our desired state in, say, config files or scripts. And when we deploy them into Kubernetes, they become our running state. And Kubernetes constantly checks between the two to see if there are any differences. So if I have a deployment into Kubernetes that says I want one instance of SQL Server running at all times in this deployment, if anything happens to that instance, Kubernetes will automatically fix that for me. So let's go and have a look at testing high availability for SQL Server running on Kubernetes. So I have my local cluster here. I've got a Docker desktop, it's really cool. Um, if you haven't checked it out, I'll where are we? If you want a one node instance of Kubernetes running, you can come here into the Docker settings and it is literally a checkbox and it will give you a one node cluster that you can use to play around on your local Windows 10 box. Works on, um, I think it works on Mac as well. If you're running on Linux, you can use things like micro um, K8 or K3S loads of different stuff to get that one nose cluster up. But anyway, here we go. I'm on my one node cluster. There it is. And now what I'm going to do is I am going to deploy one pod running SQL Server. So similar to Docker run, kube control run, something called SQL Server from the image, accepting the end user license agreement and setting an SA password. There we go. Getting a warning because I'm using some out of date it still works. And then I'm going to expose, expose that deployment as well so I can connect to it. There we go. OK. Now, let's have a look. Let's have a look at my deployment. 
there we go. SQL Server up to date and available one on one. My pod, where SQL Server is actually running. And then my service. Let's see. Yeah, okay. So, what should have happened here is I should have got an external IP of localhost running there. And that would have allowed me to drop into Management Studio and localhost into Management Studio, and I could have connected in immediately. And as there seems to be something wrong with my local Docker desktop install, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something called port forwarding. And I'm going to expose port 15789 on my host into 1433 in my pod, just so I can connect. It's not ideal, but it will work. There we go. And if I come here, I can do this. There we go. And if I do select at that version, there we go, Microsoft SQL Server 2019, RTM CU5. And if I come down, I can use something called the MS SQL CLI. Go and check that out, it's really cool. It's basically SQL command, but has the really cool things like IntelliSense and a little bit better formatting. But there we are, okay. So I have my instance of SQL Server up and running in Kubernetes on my local machine. Let's test out that high availability. So I have a pod running with an IP address of 10.1.1.99, up for 104 seconds. Let's grab that pod name and then delete it. And what I'm doing here is I'm making the running state differ from the desired state. And hopefully, Kubernetes will realize that and automatically fix it for me. So we can come here and do get pods. And there we are. We have a new pod up and running, age of 16 seconds. It has a different IP address. This is where the services come in. If the service had been working, I could just reconnect to localhost and it would all be working. But because that's not working, I have to come back here, do my port forwarding again. And then I could do a refresh of my connection. And yay, I'm connected back into SQL. So that's a really simple chaos engineering experiment to run. Nice and manual. We go in, OK, Kubernetes has some high availability built into it, apparently. Let's test that by deleting that pod and seeing what happens. And it worked exactly as we expected it to. And I could do the same thing here, test it out. There we go. One pod died. Running state no longer matches the desired state. Kubernetes automatically fixed that for us. Okay. So, coming on to the end of the session, I'm just minding the time. Let's come back into the slides for a second. So, that's got we're running a Kubernetes proof of concept in my local company at the moment. And I remember saying to my boss, hey, look at this. And I went through that exact demo with him. Look how this works, how we don't need to rely on SQL Server's high availability. We can use the built-in functionality in Kubernetes. He's like, that's great. OK. We need to get some approval to run with this from the management level. And to be honest with you, Andrew, your, your demo is a little dry. It's very codey. You know, can you maybe jazz it up? for the managers. And I was sort of saying, jazz it up, jazz it up. You mean like jazz hand? I don't know. Um, it was like just anything. What, what can you do to jazz it up a little bit? I was like, well, well, what they really want is like a nice graphical user interface that I can click and show and make it really pretty for them to see SQL Server's high availability running, right? And he was like, yeah, yeah, that'd be really good. Oh, OK. okay. Well, I've got a GUI. We can use a GUI. And what if that GUI was Space Invaders? This is a project I found on GitHub a while ago now. It's made from a really nice chap. Um, talked to him quite a bit. And this is a chaos engineering tool for applications running on Kubernetes. It is called Kube Invaders. And it works exactly as you think it does. You play the little spaceship, and the invaders are your applications running there. So let's go ahead and let's play Space Invaders with SQL Server running on Kubernetes. So I have my code here. I'm going to switch to an AKS cluster running up in Azure. This doesn't work locally. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to deploy 10 pods running SQL Server, this replicas of 10. So I'm going to run 10 of those. 
And then I'm going to come over to my instance of Kube Invaders, which I need to refresh because it's been sitting there for ages. And there are my 10 pods. So I can watch my pods. There they are. And now I can play the game. And I can kill that one. Let's kill that one. Let's kill that one. And I needed to do that. And what we should be able to see now is the high availability of Kubernetes kicking in. It's realized, hey, there's not 10 pods running here. I need to spin up a couple of new ones. So as I'm killing those, you can see the pods going down. But you can see Kubernetes realizing that the desired state no longer matches the running state and automatically fixing it for me. So there we go. That's a really, really nice graphical way of showing Kubernetes high availability using Space Invaders. This is probably my favorite GitHub repo that I've come across. I really like the fact that I can just stick it into automatic mode and let it play itself as well. I mean, eventually, things will go wrong because applications really don't like being spun up and blown away, spun up and blown away, spun up and blown away. But it'll stay there for quite a while. And yep, you can see it kicking in, new pods being spun up as the old ones go down. OK. Right, dropping back into slides. I should have gone to the demo. OK, just got some resources for you here. The top one there is the Principles of Chaos.org website. It really is a starting point if you're looking to get into chaos engineering. The next one down is my GitHub account with the slides and all the code for the demos that I've been running. Also includes, uh, if you want to, detailed instructions on how to get Kube Invaders up and running. Then there's the Chaos Toolkit. I mentioned that earlier. Open source, really good tool for plugging scripts in and running chaos engineering experiments. Second to last is a GitHub account that just has an absolute wealth of links and knowledge and great stuff about chaos engineering. And then finally, at the bottom, there is the link to the GitHub account for Kube Invaders. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, I've got a quick one for you, Andrew. Yeah, sure. Um, it's just with the pasta tests that you mm -hmm. did um, for kind of checking the state and where you chatted about the um, default settings for how many times it will come back up within like a six hour period. Yes. Could you then use something like a pasta test to actually go and check your infrastructure to you make sure that that is kind of happening and then kick that out to a kind of a report somewhere? That is so you've written the code already. Yep. That's exactly what we do. We actually use Jenkins in our environment. What Jenkins does is it goes through each one of our instances, runs a PowerShell, uh, PowerShell, PowerShell command to get the values and then plug them into a pester test. And if they're not the expected values, it will then throw an error to us and say, this cluster's not configured the way we want it to be. Go and sort it out. So yeah, I mean, uh, the, what, what I love about PowerShell and tests and pester and things like this, if it can be coded, it can be tested. So you can absolutely do that. Does that, did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, cool. All right. See, I think I've got one question. Of course. Is, did, the, uh, did you actually convince the people with the, uh, to, to go for Kubernetes? We are still running our proof of concept. Yeah, I did. Um, <laughs> They sort of went, yeah, okay, Andrew, um, if you stop banging on about it, we'll give you some virtual machines and some storage. You can go and test a <laughs> SQL Server. There, we started off with EKS. Um, there are, uh, yeah, okay, well, let's go. The, there are multiple issues with running a managed um, Kubernetes environment for things like SQL Server. So with a trad traditional Kubernetes deployment, you'll have, say, I don't know, say 30 pods, say running Nginx. If one of those pods dies, it doesn't matter. The rest of them will continue. If a node dies with a load of pods on it, it doesn't matter. The rest of the pods will continue it. But because we can't stripe SQL Server data across instances easily, we can only have one SQL instance. So if a node goes down, we need that instance to move off that node very quickly and come back up on another node. Now, this is all controlled in the Kubernetes API server. And you don't have access to that running a managed Kubernetes instance. So if a node goes down, you have to wait for the default amount of time before it gets moved off that node, which is unfortunately five minutes. And five minutes of downtime for us just wasn't acceptable. So then we moved on to building our 
own in-house deployment, which the great thing about managed Kubernetes instance is really easy to spin up. Building on your own in-house, it's not quite so easy. You have to learn, it's a bit of a learning curve, mm. but that's where we're at at the moment. Cool. So yeah, I mean we are we're still getting there. I mean, there were issues with storage, and you have to use a, something called a container storage interface. And the problem is that we're using VMware's one, and it works, but there are known bugs in it. And some of them are showstoppers for us. So if they can get around those bugs, then we can go ahead with it. Mm. Cool. One more quick question for the Kubernetes slash Docker bits. Of course. If you kill off the SQL instance when it's running in either Kubernetes or Docker, how does that come back? Is that coming back up? Um, if you've got like pending transactions, is it coming back up in recovery to recover that log and then it's active? It, if, you've, if, you've, you if you up? haven't persisted your data, you're going to lose everything. But if you have persisted your data, it will react exactly the same way a normal SQL instance would. So if there are in-flight transactions when it goes down, it's going to go into recovery and roll back those uncommitted transactions. So as it comes back up, yeah, it'll do exactly, it'll go through recovery just like any normal SQL instance. Cool. Any other questions for Andre? Well, um, yeah, I'll just uh, I'll reiterate what I said at the beginning. Thanks so much for uh, for doing this session. Um, Andrew, no problem at all. I'll go back to the uh, resources as well. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, I mean, it would be good if we can um, post the links, some of these links, or a link to uh, uh, or, or the slide deck on the uh, meetup pages. Um, so yeah, I'll send it over to you. No problem. I think we've also got a recording of this, which I'll stop now as well, um, and we'll we'll post this. We'll have a chat with the other the other groups, and we'll see how we can. Uh, how we can actually post this and, and distribute it. So just stop the recording.